Um, I left you with a bit of a cliffhanger uh, last time where we, we looked at uh, the possible interference between my salary transaction and my union dues transaction and how if they both happened concurrently uh, then if we weren't careful uh, uh, some bad outcomes could happen namely that uh, the result of one transaction could overwrite the other, which, if I'm lucky, means I get paid, but uh, it looks like my union dues haven't come out. And if I'm unlucky, it looks like I pay my union dues and I don't get paid. Uh, so the question was, how does that not happen? And indeed, that's the, the, the guts of the next bunch of stuff I want to teach you how to do. And I thought I'd work my way in via some old test questions. So here we go. Here's uh, Mucker, Tucker, Pucker and Ducker, um, uh, which is another television reference. Uh, so, um, so four programmers, <coughs> Mucker, Tucker, Pucker and Ducker, attempt to implement a pair of concurrent transactions A and B, sometimes using locks to avoid interference between transactions. Here's the code they deliver. And you can see, well I haven't explained locks to you yet, but that's what's about to happen. You can see, well you can see Mucker's code. Uh, he's, Mucker has implemented A and B, uh, two transactions. Uh, one of them, is, so transaction A basically amounts to uh, X transferring 5 to Y. You see that's what's going to happen? for A, and then B is Y transferring uh, 10 to X. So we've got uh, uh, two transactions and uh, they are operating on the same two variables, the same bits of memory. So the question is, uh, what, what happens? Uh, and you can see, well, um, let me show you the bottom of the question. You get a grid. You get told that initially X is 20 and Y is 30. And you're asked what can happen afterwards. So uh, you're asked to say for each of these possible outcomes, whether the code written by each of the programmers can possibly achieve that outcome. Uh, given the chaos that can happen when you run uh, programs that share memory concurrently. So uh, let's try and be a bit systematic about what's going on. Let's, um, let's first of all figure out what Mucker's code actually does. So there'll be a transaction A and a transaction B. Am I on the screen? Yes. Good. Okay. So what A is going to do is read X and then it's going to, because it in order to evaluate one of these assignments, you first of all have to evaluate the expression on the right hand side of the equal sign. And that means you've got to look up all the variables that occur in that expression in left to right order. So we've got to look up x in order to figure out what x minus 5 is. And then uh, that code will write x. And then it will read y. And then it will write y. Okay. And then program B will actually do the same sequence of actions. Read x, write x, read y, <coughs> write y. Okay. So the each of program A's actions will happen in this order. And each of program B's action will happen in this order. 
The only thing that's up for grabs is as the operating system gives control to each of programs A and B uh, for different slices of time, the question is how these actions will interleave with each other. So although you're sure that these will happen in sequence and these will happen in sequence, what we don't know is how they'll interleave with each other. That's, that's the mystery. And with different interleavings, different possible answers can happen. Okay, so do you think Mocker's code can deliver the outcome where x is 25 and y is 25? Does that seem plausible? Well, they start with uh, x is 20 and y is 30. So let's suppose a runs to completion before b even starts. Then uh, what's happening? x gives y 5. That's what a does. So that would get us to x is 15, y is 35. And then if b runs to completion, y gives x 10. So we'll end up with them both having 25. So if A runs and then B, if, the, the, if it happens to work out in that order, uh, then indeed they will end up with 25 each. And as it happens, if B goes first and then A happens afterwards, <coughs> we'll get the same answer, just by a different route. Uh, it'll go to X is 30 um, then, and Y is 20 if B go, runs first. <coughs> And then when A runs afterwards, uh, the, um, uh, the, they'll go back to 25 each. Uh, so if they execute sequentially, A then B, or B then A, and that is one possibility, that's two possibilities, uh, then we'd end up with uh, X is 25 and Y is 25. So, uh, so yeah, so Mucker's code can make that happen. Now, let's see. <coughs> Part B says, is it possible that A and B complete with X being 20 and Y being 30? That's the same situation we start in. So, is it possible that nothing at all happens. That they run to completion without making any changes. No, no that's not possible. Uh, some sort of memory write will happen and that will definitely change the value of at least one of the variables. So there's no way these programs can run to completion without changing anything at all. Okay, but next question. Is it possible to end up with x being 15 and y being 35? Yes, that is possible. Let's see how. That would be the effect of a happening and b not happening. Yeah? If A happens but somehow B apparently didn't happen, uh, then we end up with X is 15 and Y is 35. So let's put back this picture. How could A happen and then uh, B not happen? Well, B happens, it's just that it's possible that it's all of its actions get overwritten. So the things can <coughs> happen in this order. A could read and then B could read. And then B could write. And then A could write. So what would that do? Um, uh, A and B would both read the initial 20. 
and then uh, B would add 10 to that 20 to get 30, A would subtract 5 to get 15. B would write the 30, and then A would overwrite the 30 with the 15, just as if B hadn't happened at all. There's nothing to stop that happening. And then the same thing could happen with the other one. They both read at pretty much the same time. B writes first, A writes second. And that means that A wins, basically. So there's nothing in Mucker's code to stop that happening. We'd better tick this box. Okay. That's that box. Next question. How about the outcome uh, x is 30 and y is 25? Is that possible? How could it possibly happen? Well, if x ends up with 30, that means that b has uh, done its thing to x, but uh, a, uh, a's impact on x hasn't happened at all. Uh, so that could happen like this. Maybe a reads first, b reads second, but if a writes first before b writes, then uh, the plus ten, the minus five, the subtracting five will be overwritten by the adding ten. However, if we're trying to achieve the outcome that y is twenty five, we better make sure that both of the y actions happen. Yeah, we better. The only way y can end up being. Uh, 25, starting from 30, is if we subtract 10 and then add 5. So we better finish off something like this. So that B gets to read Y and write Y, so that means Y goes down to 20, and then A reads Y and writes Y, so it goes up to 25. So you can see, I've made sure that A's actions happen in order, B's actions happen in order, but there is an interleaving which makes that alternative wrong outcome happen. Okay, so we can take this box. And then the last tell asks us if A and B can get stuck in deadlock. And I haven't told you what that is yet, so I'd better get on with it. Also, how are we to understand Tucker's program, it's got this lock business in it. Right. So what's going on with lock? You can see that the lock construct takes two things. It takes a variable, in this case we have an x, followed by a block of code inside curly braces. And what that means is that uh, that construct demands exclusive access to the variable. So here, program A is saying, I want to have X all to myself. Nobody else will be allowed to do anything to X while I'm executing the code in the curly braces. Okay? Does that make sense? So, uh, only one process can lock a variable <coughs> at one time. So that means if, uh, if A successfully takes the lock for X, then B is not allowed to do anything to X while the code in the curly braces is happening. Now that doesn't mean things necessarily get stuck, it just means that B has to wait until the lock is released. And similarly, uh, if, 
If somebody else had blocked X, then in order to execute its own block X, A would have to wait until uh, X was available to be locked. So those, uh, that's the idea. The, uh, basically, the program says to the operating system, I would like exclusive access to this variable. Uh, please wake my thread up again when I can have exclusive <coughs> access to that variable. So it, it's, it's not in trouble, it's not stuck, it's just waiting for its turn. So you can see uh, Mucker, or Tucker's code, program A, first of all tries to lock X, and then once it has locked X, the block of code that's being executed starts by trying to lock Y. And then, uh, once it has uh, successfully locked Y, then it does its operations to change X and Y. Okay? Uh, so, uh, what, what transaction A is saying is, uh, wait until I can take both variables X and Y and have them all to myself, and then do this update. And what that means, we say, so a process which locks all of the variables it uses. So if it, if it does some modifications to some variables, but it wraps those modifications in locks for all of those variables, we call that sort of process atomic. And we, the reason we call it atomic is that from the point of view of thinking about what can happen concurrently, we can now treat A as if it happens all at once. <coughs> so let's see what actions uh, Tucker's program actually does. <coughs> so this is Tucker. Uh, Tucker's code is going to lock X, A is going to lock X, and then it's going to lock Y. And then looking carefully at where the closing curly braces are, the unlocks happen in reverse order at the end. It unlocks Y, and then it unlocks X. Okay, can you all see that? <coughs> So this opening curly brace is when the lock Y happens, and the matching closing curly brace is when the unlock Y happens. So that's this lock Y and that unlock Y. And then outside of that, this opening curly brace and this <coughs> close, maybe I'll do that in a different color. This, uh, these two matching braces correspond to these, this lock and this unlock. Everybody see what's going on? If you don't see what's going on, now's a good time to shut. Um, right? So, if you can see how to translate this program A into this sequence of actions by looking at where the lock constructs are and seeing where their, their opening and closing curly braces are, then you see what sequence of memory accesses uh, A is trying to achieve. Okay, so the rules are that once a lock instruction has been executed successfully, no other process is allowed to access the locked variable. Okay. Uh, so then the question uh, of what Tucker's um, uh, process can do, what Tucker's programs can do, boils down to where does, <laughs> you can see, B, wants to read and write uh, X and Y. So it, once Tucker's A process has successfully taken both locks, B won't be able to do anything. <coughs> However, uh, that could all happen at any stage during the execution of B. So we're in a situation where we could have A happening here, or here, or here, <coughs> or here, or here. There are five different points in time 
at which A would run. But once A gets going, uh, B is uh, effectively stuck what, until A finishes, and then B can finish its job. So once the unlocks happen, B is then free to access memory again. So what the locks are doing is constraining the ways in which the operating system will allow the processes to take turns. So let's play the same game. Can Tucker's code achieve the outcome where they both get 25? <coughs> yes. yes, it can. Actually, that will happen either with this situation or with this one, right? If A just runs to completion before B starts, or after B finishes, then we'll get 25 each. <coughs> so we like to refer to that as the sequential outcome. That's the outcome, if, uh, <coughs> never mind the possibility of concurrency, if the reality is that the two programs run in sequence, then we get a sequential outcome, and no matter how much or little locking is present, a sequential outcome is always possible. That's to say, just because concurrency is available doesn't mean it will actually happen. Uh, so if you recognize one of the outcomes that you're offered as a sequential outcome, you know that no matter what the locking strategy is, it's achievable. Correspondingly, we can tick off all of those boxes. Um, <coughs> is that a hand or is it uh, a, you know, a yawn? Uh, uh, okay, so we also figured out that again, uh, there's no way, well we said there's no way for uh, A and B to run to completion but leave memory completely unchanged. Some memory write is going to happen sometime. So I think we can safely take the, uh, the num box there. Uh, but let's have a look at x being 15 <coughs> and y being 35. Is that possible? But how did it happen last time? That happened last time because A's operations were interrupted by B's operations. That was how we made it possible. Now, with these locks in place, can A's operations be interrupted by B's operations? No. no. So that outcome is no longer possible. Okay. How about x being 30 and y being 25? Is that achievable? It certainly is. If we remember how that happened, we had b being interrupted by a and then uh, the, when doing the X part of the job, but the Y uh, operations happening in sequence. So if we put the code back here, uh, if A happened in between B reading X and B writing X, what would happen? B would read that x is 20, and it would want to set x to 25. Then the whole of A would happen. So x would go up to 30. Uh, have I got that right? Let me check. Um, so we want x to end up being 30. Sorry, B reads that x is 20 and wants to set x to 30. Right, so B has read x is 20, wants to write x is 30. 
the whole of A happens in between the two. So that means after B has read X is 20, A makes uh, X 15 and Y 35. But then once it unlocks X, B can carry on. B writes X is 30, and then it does its operation, subtracting 10 uh, from Y, and we end up with X is 30 and Y is 25. So Tucker can certainly achieve this outcome. Okay. Let's move on to Pucker. What does Pucker's code do? Can everyone see that's what's going on with Pucker's code? <coughs> Pucker's A program tries to lock, <laughs> has a lock X outside a lock Y, so it will lock X first and Y second. Pucker's B process is the other way around. It tries to lock Y and then lock X before doing its transaction. So <laughs> both processes are atomic. That tells us something useful, namely that if both run to completion, it will be on the basis that we have either A then B or B then A. That's to say, if we get an outcome at all, it will be a sequential outcome. And we know that either way around, uh, the sequential outcome is 25 each. So we know that Pucker's code can certainly deliver the sequential outcome, and we know that Pucker's code can't deliver any of these other weird outcomes if it runs to completion. But there is another possibility which you should be aware of. What happens if the operating system happens to let these processes run in such a way that, say, first of all, A locks X, and then B locks Y. <laughs> what happens next? Nothing. 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 We're stuffed. <coughs> because the next thing B wants to do is lock X, and it can't lock X until A releases X, until A unlocks X. So B is stuck because A holds the lock on X. However, the next thing A wants to do is lock Y. And that can't happen because B holds the lock on Y. So, um, as, as, any, uh, as any professional will tell you, uh, if, uh, uh, if you mess around with locks, uh, you have to know what you're doing. Otherwise, you get yourself into a very nasty predicament. Um, so here we've got a, a situation which is referred to as deadlock. That's to say, each process holds a lock uh, that stops the other processes acting. So we're stuck. So the, there's always a clue for deadlock where you see processes taking locks in different orders from each other. You should always, when you see that, you should always watch out for deadlock. Because it's possible uh, that each process will grab one lock, uh, uh, you know, they'll, they'll each grab different <coughs> locks and then 
uh, and then they'll get stuck. So here we're saying that Pucker's code can achieve deadlock. How about Pucker and Tucker? Can they achieve deadlock? No, they can't. Because uh, in Mucker's case, there aren't any locks, so there can't be any deadlock. And in Tucker's case, only one of the processes is taking locks. So, uh, so there's no way that they could each lock each other out. So no danger of deadlock for Mucker and Tucker. Uh, but Pucker, by taking locks in different orders, has created the possibility of deadlock. Now there's an important thing to understand about the possibility of deadlock. That is not the same thing as the inevitability of deadlock. Just because Pucker's code makes deadlock possible, that does not mean that deadlock will happen. And in particular, you can bet that Pucker will have tested this code hundreds and hundreds of times and seen nothing go wrong and decided to ship it. And then the moment a customer tries to use it, that's when it deadlocks. So uh, yeah, be, be aware that possibility is not the same thing as inevitability. And also be aware that uh, uh, the operating system is basically Murphy's Law. Right? If it can go wrong, it will, but when, when it will be maximally embarrassing. Uh, so uh, you've got to treat operating systems with the respect they deserve, otherwise they'll mess you up good and proper when, you, uh, when it matters. So, how about Ducker's code? Uh, can Ducker's code do any of these weird wrong answer outcomes? No. No, because Ducker has made both transactions atomic. So we will get either A then B or B then A. Can Ducker's code deadlock? No, because they both race to take the first lock. And whichever one wins the race goes first. <coughs> But then the other one, but it will be free to finish. And that means the other one will successfully go second. So Ducker, by taking the locks in the same order, it's a good clue by the way, if your variables have names, take the locks in alphabetical order. Uh, that way uh, uh, you can be sure that you're not risking deadlock. When you see, when you see out of order, variables being locked, you should be suspicious. Uh, so here, uh, Ducker has done the right thing, uh, taken the locks in the same order, made both transactions atomic, and that means the only possible outcome is the correct outcome. Well done, Ducker. All right. So what have we got through? We, fi we figured out how to write down the memory access sequences uh, that correspond uh, to uh, these programs in this little language with uh, assignment, sequential composition, and locks. And we've seen uh, how uh, if you lock all the variables that you're going to use, and only use them when you lock them, then you get atomic processes that act as if they can't be interrupted. But we've seen that if you take locks in the wrong order, there's a danger of deadlock. And these things happen. Uh, the, uh, you, you do, there's, there's a big industry in particular in, in the financial sector uh, of, uh, of tracking down and preventing deadlocks in, in real code. That's Frank Marker uh, telling me I should give it up for a day. Um, so what I'm going to do, uh, I basically lined up 
um, uh, Monday's lecture as a kind of uh, let's do some problems lecture. So I'll do some more transaction problems on Monday. Uh, and I uh, probably will throw in a clocks and memory problem just uh, before your uh, second attempt at that. Uh, but uh, uh, we, can, uh, we can throw in a, a bunch more revision now we've reached this stage of term. I should also tell you uh, that uh, there are two lovely transaction problems waiting for you as this week's homework. Uh, they're the same sort of thing. I always like to do this because they're so easy to mark, uh, where uh, you always get uh, different versions of the same program with different locking strategies, and you get asked whether certain outcomes are possible. And you end up filling in a grid. On that, you fill in zeros and ones for not possible and possible. And that means it can all be marked automatically, which is bliss. Um, so uh, have fun with that, and have a great weekend, and I'll see you all on Monday. One minute papers in the box, please.